You may not know it, but substance abuse is taking a big bite out of your wallet. It's costing you and every other person in America nearly $2,000 a year. That adds up to a whopping $1.4 billion in North Dakota and a staggering $600 billion across the United States. That's a pretty hefty price tag. So where does all that money go? Every year, our economy absorbs all kinds of costs for medical care, involvement with the criminal justice system, work loss, treatment, and lost quality of life because of alcohol, tobacco, and other drug abuse. Okay, before we get ahead of ourselves, what exactly is substance abuse? Some people enjoy sharing a beer or a glass of wine with friends and family. And sometimes we take medicine to help us feel better when we're sick or in pain. But when we drink too much or drink too young or take medications for the wrong reasons in amounts not recommended by a doctor, that's when substance use becomes substance abuse. So why should you care? Well, believe it or not, substance abuse is impacting you. It's impacting me. It's impacting all of us, especially when it comes to underage drinking and adult binge drinking. We certainly have a lot to be proud of, but there are some facts we simply cannot ignore. Even though it's legal for those over 21, alcohol is the most commonly abused and destructive drug in our state. There are more deaths from alcohol than from all other illegal drugs combined. It's a major contributing factor to crime and incarceration. And on average, one alcohol-related crash occurs every 8.9 hours. But drinking isn't just an adult problem. It's a problem for our kids. Underage drinking is not only illegal, it's dangerous. And the consequences can last a lifetime. People who start drinking before age 15 are four times more likely to become addicted than those who wait until they're 21. And because an adolescent's brain is still developing, alcohol can seriously damage the parts of the brain that influence decision-making, learning, memory, and impulse control. More than one in 10 North Dakota high school students reported having their first drink before age 13. And over 60% have had a drink sometime in their life. Underage drinking leads to all kinds of harm including traffic crashes, violence, problems in school, property crime, unintentional injuries, and high-risk sex. And it's costing North Dakotans nearly $160 million a year. Clearly, substance abuse, especially alcohol abuse, is a major public health issue in our state. It impacts our families, friends, and communities every day. So how did we get the label of being the beer belly of the nation? How did this become such an important public health concern? Easy access to alcohol and the normalization of drinking are two big factors. Alcohol is everywhere and has become part of our culture. With more bars per capita than any other state, it's hard to blame some North Dakotans for getting the wrong idea about alcohol. And while most people don't condone underage drinking, they perceive others as being okay with it. And that too, creates a more lenient environment overall. As a nation, we've spent a lot of time and money trying to treat substance abuse and the problems related to it. But it's also vital to make sure we're taking steps to prevent it from happening in the first place. So what is prevention? Let's talk about it. Here's a quick story to get us started. There's an often told parable about a couple named John and Amy fishing along the banks of a river. Suddenly they see a woman drowning in the water. They jump in the water and pull her out. After pulling her ashore, they notice another person in the river in need of help. Before long, the river is filled with drowning people and John runs to find help. After several hours, everyone is exhausted and defeated because they couldn't save everybody. Then, Amy starts to walk upstream. John asks her, where are you going? Amy replies, I'm going upstream to see why so many people keep falling into the river. As it turns out, the bridge leading across the river upstream has a hole through which people are falling. Amy realizes that fixing the hole in the bridge will prevent many people from ever falling into the river in the first place. So that's how prevention works. It's moving upstream to identify and fix the problem 
so people don't fall into the river. It's preventing problems before they occur by creating an environment that promotes health and well-being. Prevention is not treating an already existing problem. It's also not many of the things we tend to think of as prevention, like one-time speaking events and scare tactics. These activities may raise awareness, but they often don't change behavior. Prevention is more complex. It's rooted in science with input from many systems, including health, education, justice, and social services. Most importantly, prevention is most effective when all these stakeholders and all community members work together to take action. And it's cost effective, saving us $10 for every $1 invested. In order to get that bang for your buck and truly make a difference, there are a few important steps to take. The first step is to understand what is happening upstream. We do this by collecting data and information to understand the problem. Next, we need to bring people together who are ready and willing to help us fix the bridge. Then, it's time to plan how to fix the bridge in the most effective way. Now comes the best part, putting the plan into action so real change can happen. But it doesn't stop there. We need to continue monitoring the bridge to make sure it remains strong over time. After decades of research, many strategies have been proven to make a difference. Prevention experts today advocate a mix of community-specific strategies that focus on the individual and creating an environment that supports healthy behavior. So, what are the most effective prevention strategies? One of them is to enhance policies and ensure they are enforced. For example, when the price of alcoholic beverages goes up, consumption often goes down, especially among high-risk groups like heavy drinkers, adolescents, and young adults. Studies also show higher penalties for DUIs mean fewer crashes and more saved lives. Another effective strategy is to train servers and retailers on ways to avoid illegally selling alcohol to underage youth and intoxicated customers. These environmental prevention strategies can create big changes over time, changes that can save lives. For example, it is estimated that alcohol-related crashes have decreased 16% since the minimum drinking age was increased to 21, saving more than 900 lives each year in the U.S. And just look at the decades-long struggle to improve public health by reducing smoking and exposure to it. There was a lot of resistance and intense debate about smoking in public, but today we enjoy better air quality and better health. And it's hard to remember a time when airplanes, restaurants, and workplaces weren't smoke-free. And seatbelts are another example. Primary enforcement seatbelt laws are getting more people to buckle up, which again saves lives. Change can happen, but it's never easy, especially when trying to shift a cultural norm. It takes time, persistence, and big-time collaboration. Communities are coming together and recognizing that investing in substance abuse prevention is important. In fact, it's one of the best investments we can make in our state's future, creating safe and healthy individuals, families, and communities. That's where you come in. We hope you have a better understanding of what substance abuse prevention is, why it matters, and what works so that you'll step forward anytime there's an opportunity to engage with your community, show support for proven policies and strategies, and help make your community a healthier place. We can make a difference, together. <laughs>